Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our coverage of the FIDE Grand Swiss. This is the tournament being held in Latvia with an open section, a women's section, and obviously the top finishers of which qualify for the candidates' cycles on both sides. Now, we are going to be covering games around round 7 and 8 today. The video is called what it's called because of the first game that we're going to begin with which is uh, a game between Grandmaster Andrei Velikitin from Ukraine, rated 2652, and Levan Aranyan, rated 2782, but in the past, 2835. Uh, Velikitin begins the game with e4, we have e5, and we have knight f3, knight c6, and let me just tell you, this is going to be a really fun recap, because all the games are exciting, the big news out of Riga, Latvia is exciting. You're just going to have to watch till the end, you're not going to skip around, right? Good. All right, Rue Lopez. And also Levy taking a sip of peppermint tea. A6. You should tell me in the comments what your favorite type of tea is. Knight f6, castles, b5, and now we see this variation, b5 and bishop to c5. The modern Archangelsk, we've seen this many times, and uh, we've actually seen this main line as well. d4, bishop b6, a5, and bishop to a7. All of those things happen. They've happened in other games by other people. Levan Ranyan himself has played this position with the black pieces already before. Here, Valakitin plays the move h3. So step one to defeating a 2800 level player is you need to know the theory like the back of your hand. You also ideally should be a GM, but all of, obviously that goes without saying all of you already meet that criteria. Um, bishop to b7. And now we have two moves. We have rook to e1 and bishop to e3. In this tournament, we have seen the move rook to e1 played, which scores exceptionally well. Um, but uh, Rook E1 is also played in this position. So um, now you, by the way, just a couple moves ago, you actually really should be playing the move H3 because otherwise the bishop can come here and that's sort of a problem, uh, which is why it's important to know your theory in, you know, the opening. Um, so now Rook E1. And uh, we've seen Alexei Shirov play the move E takes D4 in this position. Uh, we saw that a couple of rounds ago, but here Levon plays a uh, knight back to E7. Now that, X, that is a move that's been played here. Uh, only about three times, and the idea is you're just blocking this rook. You're congesting the e-file, and you're preemptively defending this knight on e4. However, you are removing a defender of the e5 pawn, and so naturally white takes the e5 pawn. Now, up until this moment in the game, the players were following a game between uh, Abdus Saturov, Nodirbek Abdus Saturov, and um, his opponent, I think Vincent Keimer, but I could be mistaken. Um, I was doing some research on this game before I made this video. Uh, Maurizi, Maurizi, uh, Marcandria Maurizi, not, not Keimer, uh, another player who's very strong and very young uh, in these online events. And in that game, Abdus Saturov, I believe in this position, um, took an e5. Well, uh, Valakitin plays the best move. Now, whether or not Valakitin had actually prepared this before the game and knew of that game, he shows tremendous preparation. That is by far the top engine suggestion. Um, which makes me really wonder what the hell is going on after DE5. I mean, black takes, but is, I think black is not supposed to take this pawn. I think here black is just supposed to castle. And Levon took an E5. And so all great players do make mistakes in the opening, and now you either demonstrate your preparation or you demonstrate your ability to outplay them once the preparation phase is over. We have knight going back to D6, covering the rook attack, and now knight G5. We are jumping into this territory. Um, and Levon has a little bit of a problem because if he just lazily plays the move castles, you know, thinking he's completely fine, after Queen H5, it's already time to resign for black um, because the only way to stop mate is this and then I take. And you can't take because you're going to lose your queen. But you actually have to take because otherwise you're going to lose much more than the queen. So um, for that reason, he plays knight to d5, blocking the route of the bishop. Now to the untrained eye, bishop d5 is a free knight. To the trained eye, when the knight moved to d5, the queen opened up over here. So what does Valakitian do? Well, he plays knight takes f7 anyway. Ooh, baby, that's a spicy move. Now you take the knight, and when the dust settles, it is Valakitian who is in a very, very comfortable position. He has won his pawn back uh, uh, on, on f7 in this case, and a couple of things are really good about this situation. First of all, a huge weakness on e5. Second of all, a pretty big weakness on a6. And if that pawn makes it through, the game is simply over. Um, and just more activity. The rook and the queen are very nice. So knight to d2, and now a high-level move. Transforming your advantage. Not always necessary, but I really like this move. Queen to g4. What we're doing by trading the queens and actually voluntarily damaging our structure is we're removing black's only active piece, 
Um, and therefore, we're removing Black's most active defender as well, if it's the most active piece. Not like in basketball, you could have a really good offensive player, not great defensive player. In that case, the queen is gone. And now white is going to try to slowly chip away. Land a knight on a certain square, continue to maintain pressure on all of black's weaknesses. Uh, Levon plays c6, rook infiltrates on d7, knight comes to g5, and there we go. I told you we were going for that weakness. Now, black has a difficult decision. Do you play rook to a8 and render all of your pieces mightily passive? The idea being that after it takes takes, this rook is in jail. And the knight will go to c5, like one-way ticket to c5. Uh, you can then no longer move your rook. If you play knight e6 preventing this, you give yourself new problems. I can put my rook here. I can put my rook on e1. You, you just, you're too passive, even though material is equal. So Levon doesn't do that. He says, nope, active only. And then he plays this move. That is the move that super GMs play when it's, when it's desperate times call for desperate measures. A wounded animal is the, you know, a wounded super GM is the most dangerous. Two pawns hanging. Now they're going to start tricking you. For example, if you don't take on c5 and instead you take on a6, here comes c4, here comes the rook, here comes the second rook, because you have to move your knight away from this square. Um, so he takes on c5 and rook d2. Levon is going for the utmost active counterplay that he can find, but Valakitin stays cool, calm, and collected and plays the move knight to d7. And um, if you move the rook off the back rank, there's all sorts of rook a8, rook a6, knight e5. So rook to d8. Now Valakitin is up two pawns. One. But now... Rather than taking the a6 pawn, he brings the next rook to the party. Why? So this knight cannot come forward. He needs black's knight to stay at bay and stay over there. And if, and if black were to play this move, there would just be a mate. That's a back rank mate. So, Levon makes a little space for his king. Knight g6, knight comes back to h4. Why? Because we're rerouting to f5. We're no longer focusing on this weakness. We're focusing on the g7 weakness. And Levon continues to kind of do some stuff on the queen side, but Valakitin is too fast. This knight's movement has been com completely restricted from the game. And uh, white just swarms the weaknesses, safeguards the king, and uh, on move 39 after rook to g7, black resigned. Uh, really nice game from Andrei Valakitin. A uh, beautiful game. Taking advantage of one wrong move in the opening and then bulletproof play from there. Would not be shocked if he played at a 99.9% .9 this game. Um... The only, you know, the only thing the engine might criticize is uh, the move rook to e1, like where he like didn't take the pawn and instead restricted his opponent's movement. But absolutely beautiful game, dancing around with the knight. And uh, Levon's knight over here did not move for like 15 turns to end the game. Amazing stuff. Super game from Valakitian. Next game I'd like to show you is the game between some of the front runners uh, on the women's side, uh, Nino Batsashvili and uh, Lei Tingjian from China. Uh, something that I like very much, a Queen's Gambit accepted, uh, QGA, an opening that you play with black and you leave it in white's hands whether white is going to play solid lines or active lines, like e4, very dynamic line. But white chooses knight f3, e3. This is known as the classical system. Uh, I've played this with white uh, many times. I've also played against this with black. And black's idea is exactly this, e6, a6, c5. Now, again, many ways for white to play this. White can play dc5. White can play queen e2, rook d1. White can play knight c3. White can play b3, bishop b2. White can play bishop back from b3 to b, uh, from c4 to b3, d3, or e2. And white can also play a4. Did you catch all that? Because there's also one more plan in this position. The ASAP and expedited e4. Just go e4. Now the thing is, you can't take this. It's simply too dangerous because queen e2, Rook d1, rook e1, d5. Like, white just gets a bit too much of an initiative. This is like black re reaching into a cookie jar, but instead of, you know, getting their hand slapped out of there, there's a chainsaw that will then chase you down the street. Weird analogy. Probably sounds like something someone, you know, imagined when they took some shrooms, but bear with me. Now, Lei Tingjie calls the bluff. She takes the pawn. Now, a4, b4, because black is on move 10 and has barely moved anything, right? Queen c2. Rook d1, black is trying to consolidate like we saw last game, kind of blocking the enemy rook lines. We saw Levon do that. Bishop f4, white is just trying to get quick development, except bishop f4, as natural of a move as it looks, is a major inaccuracy. In this position, actually, even maybe a couple moves ago, white was already kind of going astray. Uh, queen c2 was not correct. White had to play a something like knight d2, immediately taking care of this knight. Um, and then getting development without this knight poking around in the territory. Why? Because the longer that that knight survives, the more black can now 
calm the pressure in the center. And it looks like White actually has some good stuff going on. Rook e4 is a threat to get two pieces for the for the Rook. And actually, you know, the pressure is sort of annoying. But Lating J plays uh, Rook c8 attacking uh, the Queen. Blocked. And you see, she's escaped from the cookie jar. And if you count the pawns, it's six to five. Six pawns is more than five. And frankly, better than five. And now she's like, uh, what are your pieces doing in the middle of the board? Bishop c5. Okay, let's move the rook out of there. Now, I could castle, absolutely. I can also play queen b6. These pieces are staring directly down these diagonals. And white's pieces look active. And you would think, well, white is only down a pawn. I mean, it's not the worst thing in the world. What, that's just a pawn right there, right? It's not, the, it's not so bad. It's about to get bad. So, Nino plays a5. She attacks the queen. And while black could play the move queen a5 and just completely call the bluff, black just plays queen c6. And we see the problem. Moving this knight is going to be difficult. A couple moves later, the knight decides to stroll out here, making sure that checkmate is protected, and uh, potentially just waiting to, for black to make a move. I mean, if black plays a move like e5, you know, that's a good move. Looks like it, but it also opens up some lines and possibilities. But she plays it. And now Nino plays bishop to g5. And I just want to get like a little uh, viewer warning. From this point forward, this game becomes extremely violent. If your kids are watching, I highly recommend you cover their eyes or talk to them about, um, you know, about the uh, dangers of becoming a chess player. E4. The rook is under attack. The rook moves out of the way. Black immediately jumps the knight forward. That knight is now threatening a capture, infiltration, maybe a check, maybe coming to g4. I mean, it's not, it's not really clear what's going on. Now, black makes another move forward, attacking this rook. This rook really doesn't have many squares to go. b3 is safe, h3 is safe. So what do you do? You, it might be time to give this rook away um, because and try to counterattack on f7 because you're simply running out of moves given how active black's position is. Now black strikes again with another forward move, seemingly out of the blue, e3. A pawn move to a square that is targeted once, twice, three times, four times, five times, six times. I've never seen something like that. Making a move on a square where the entire squad can see the pawn and yet it's untouchable. Because when it gets taken, black now takes immediately. The rook is still hanging. Now this bishop is set to die. The rook on g3 cannot move because of mate. So white does this to try to throw a, a wrench in the, in the wheels or whatever. I don't, I don't know. Now bishop takes f2 check. King takes check. And now we end in style. Knight jumps into d3. You can't take it because of this. And when the king comes back, you can take the queen, you can take the bishop, you can take this, you can take the rook. But the next knight comes in to take on g3, queen g3, and rook takes e1, and white resigned. The, this was not very nice from Lei Tingjie. And she also won again in the eighth round. She has now seven out of eight, and is clear first place on the women's side. This was, this, this was a violent game. But what? That, I got nothing else to say. Now, uh, back to the open section. We have Hans Niemann uh, versus Javakir Sindarov. Sindarov, very strong player from Uzbekistan. Hans Niemann, very strong player uh, from the United States. Uh, these two gentlemen are not competing for a candidate spot, but they are competing for a good tournament, and this game was, was quite a game. So what we begin with is in English, um, and then C5. So... Black had an opportunity to just continue with bishop to g7 and probably end up in a king's indian, just a classical normal king's indian. But instead we get a total transposition to now a Sicilian defense uh, and we have an accelerated dragon. And the setup here that white is playing is known as the Maroxi bind. I always pronounce that incorrectly, Marocci, something like that, uh, which is a setup where white plays e4 and c4 and black's counterplay with b5 is restricted black's counterplay with d5 is restricted don't worry about this knight in the uh, this queen in the middle of the board in this knight moving the queen will always be able to get away now 
Um, so a couple of uh, different ways to play this. Generally, black will put a bishop on e6, a queen on a5. The knight will rotate back to d7 to activate the bishop. The knight from d7 will also make some forward movement. e6, f5 is counterplay. e6, d5 is counterplay. a6, b5 is counterplay. The rooks kind of move around and figure out where to go. Some of those moves are going to happen. Here comes bishop to e6. Here comes queen a5. Here comes rook fc8. And here comes knight d7. Everything as promised. Bishop g7, king g7. But... There is a clear problem with the bishop on e6. What is it? What is it? I'm going to take some peppermint tea. You know the problem. The bishop is a target. f4. f4. And here comes f5. And let me tell you, f5 is just very nasty. f5 is very nasty. So f6. This is a very nice example of same side attacking play from Hans Neiman. Hans plays king h1. Always a useful move. King wants to escape to another dimension. He's really tired of existing on this planet. Queen on c5 and b6 no longer hits the king. Also, g4 is now a possibility. Black plays queen b6, rook a e1, and a5. I told you counterplay on the queen side is very common, but you're not going to get to play b5. When white controls it with four pieces, and also the b pawn is behind the queen and cannot jump over it. Queen g3. Rotating over to the king side. Now f5 is possible, but Hans plays an even better move. Uh, it looks better. Bishop g4. Removing the, the control of the light squares. Um, and black doesn't really have a choice. I mean, f5 is great, e5 looks nice, but I really like bishop g4, because when the bishop takes, white has something known as a zwitschenzug, an in-between move, knight to d5. You see, if in this position you had played knight to d5, and potentially made this exchange, I'm not really sure you're as happy. Now, you do still have the bishop, and the bishop can kind of go over here, but the knight survives. When you isolate knight versus knight into a position like this, this is a very different story. Because the knights fight for the exact same color complexes. A light squared bishop cannot fight for the dark squares. Spoiler alert. So, e6. And now it's up to Hans to figure out how to break through this position. First, the first thing to do in any good position is to retreat all the pieces back to their home squares. So, Hans actually here made an inaccuracy. Rook a1 would have been better than walking the king to e1, rook h1, queen d1, queen b1, uh, knight b1. And then we go from there. But he plays this first. And here comes the counterplay. So in every good game, in every good position, your opponents are not just going to sit around and let you slap the crap out of them, um, unless they might. Uh, so you need to figure out how to deal with counterplay, right? So the A file has opened up. D6 is, uh, you know, obviously very well protected. So what does Hans do? He attacks on the side of the board where counterintuitively it seems like he's not supposed to be attacking. And then F5. And now we're ready to go. So what does black do? Knight to b8. Black is also following the strategy of putting pieces back on their home squares. Rook d1, rook b6, knight c3. Juicy square. And that is why a long time ago, Hans wanted to win the battle of the light squares. Because if you can outplay an enemy knight with your knight, that's it. If the knight wins the battle for the board, it's over. And the knight comes in. Now, black wants to trade this knight. And black is still creating counterplay. But how do you open everything up with white? You gotta just take on g6. Now you would say, well, why didn't Javakir Sindarov in this position play the move g5? Close everything up. Because it's not that easy. He's still got a major weakness. He's got two sets of weaknesses. And this one is really difficult to defend. It looks like he can create an impenetrable fortress. It all falls apart. One pawn push, and if you take, you lose your knight. So a nice game from Hans to continue the pressure down the middle and on the side. And uh, it's about to get violent. He takes on h7. Now he plays knight to e3. This knight has been hippity-hopping all over the board. It's now going to f5. And how does he end it? Straight down the middle. Queen d6 and uh, rook f3. A nice move. If rook takes f3 in this position, he actually is going to take that one. This rook hangs. The knight hangs. Rook c1. Check. And now queen back to d2. Setting up the threats of queen h6. Queen g7 afterward, but also attacking this rook. So rook d1, queen d1, and black resigned. This king wide open. Queen h5 is coming, queen g4 is coming, rook h6 is coming. And you know what the craziest thing about this game is? Hans Neiman at the end of the game had one hour on the clock, and his opponent had one minute. That's gangster. I like that. that, that that's cool. Congrats to Hans. Big win. Uh, next game, this game was absolutely nuts. This is a game between Amin Tabatabe and Kirill Alexienko. Kirill actually participated in the last candidates, 2700 GM. Uh, Tabatabe is number two in Iran, behind Parham. And this one had uh, the early makings of a nice and solid game between two esteemed grandmasters in a Catalan. But then in Bishop before check lines, 
Knight d2 is not the most accurate move uh, because you, you, you give away c4 without developing these two pieces. Like, normally, bishop here, this is the move. Um, and for example, d c4, bishop g2, bishop b4, this is not really the move. I mean, the move is bishop d2. Um, it's not a loss, but it allows black to actually play b5. And you would think that there's all sorts of discovered attacks, but white uh, doesn't, that doesn't work. It's just You don't win rooks at this level. Uh, and if you play a move like a4, which obviously looks very natural, um, black can always play c6, knight d5, bishop b7, a6, and really just hang on to that pawn that they took. And then c3 at some point will come. So, a3. A3 surprised me because I didn't think that if you went for this, you could allow this. And now he plays a4. So he plays a3, a4. The Catalan is not really an opening in which you can invent. But because of the nature of the opening, where there's this just constant pressure on black's queen side, Sometimes even the engine hates what you're doing. Humans won't be able to sustain the extra pawn position on the queen side. So e4, knight f6, and we have the following position. I mean, just a completely ludicrous looking position. So if black takes on d4, defending g7, white would play knight to f3. If then black continues to defend this pawn by playing queen to f6, white plays this move and actually can take and play like this. And there's all sorts of openings on this side of the board. So in this position, Alexienko throws it all out the window and plays the move h5. It's move 13 for black. Every single piece of his is on the back row except one. Only pawns are playing. Queen e2, let's continue playing with our pawn. That's actually a really interesting move because actually, if, if white like doesn't do anything, black takes and just walks in. So you kind of have to take this pawn now knight a6. Now the knight is traveling to d3 because you've given up, uh, you've given up the pawn defending the c5 square. e6. What? Tabata Bay has so many normal looking moves here. a, b, rook d1, knight f3 says, nah, take the pawn back. Kirill's like, okay. And now, and, and now we open up the bishop. Knight sh swarms in, a, b. Now that rook is over there. Black's like, I don't give a, I don't, I don't care. Take my rook. And Tabata Bay's like, oh crap, you actually make a really good point. If I take this rook, I got such major weaknesses near my king. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to put my knight in front of my bishop and then jump into d6. Takes, takes. And now rather than taking, Alexianko jumps into d3. Now that knight is a star. Bishop d2. You could take this pawn. This is a game of both guys giving each other everything. But that wouldn't work because queen e5 is one of the nastiest forks ever. It attacks everything. So he doesn't do that. He just continues playing h4, like cold-blooded, bro. I mean, just h4, like nothing, just h4, and then hg, and now I have an open h-file to attack you with basically any time I want. Queen takes d6. Bishop takes on g7. White is still down one pawn. Black still has the MVP knight. Rook g8, and here, uh, out of like in the middle of all this fight, rooks on the board, queens on the board, pawns on the board, Alexienko decides to get his king out of the center and hug the rook. That was not the time to do it, because now here comes queen h5. You kind of walked your king into the fire. I don't know why you did this, and not to mention this queen attacks something else, the opposite side of the board, because queens are extremely powerful. b4, bishop d2, and now bishop g4. Queen takes the empty space over here and is like, hi everybody, I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat all of you. Every single pawn around me. Very important moment in the game now for uh, Alexienko and he, he drives the bishop into e2. The rook has nowhere to go. That is the only safe square. Does he do it? No. Take my rook, I don't care. Bro Yo. What? Now, both rooks are defended. Material is completely equal. Where's the queen gonna go? Check. Natural. King g7. Okay, now you gotta move your rook. He's not doing it. And now, actually, if he, if he takes, queen takes g4 as a check. So now the bishop's not actually serving an offensive purpose. It's serving a defensive purpose of guarding the rook. Queen to e6. Alexianko's had enough. He's like, let's trade queens. And Tabata Bay goes queen b8. Queen b8 looks good because the queen continues to hang around. The problem with it is that... You're, you're, you're in some trouble. Like, the, the rook can be taken now because you're not actually attacking the rook anymore. 
But Alexanko blunders, and he plays rook d6, and rook d6 straight up allows rook takes a5. Like, completely allows it. And what, 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 what I think was missed here is rook takes g3 looks like game over, like black wins. It just looks like black wins here. Why? If you take queen e3 and rook h6, you lose. So if you don't take, what the hell do you do? Like, let's say it's just black's move in this position. I just keep going. I open up your king. King g2, I, I mean, queen e4, bishop f1, yeah, something. You're going to lose the game. Queen g4, it's over. You cannot defend against the rook and the queen. So what did he miss after rook a5, rook g3? He missed that in this position, he can play bishop d4. And when the rook takes, the queen goes through both rooks and takes the rook. I think that's what he missed. And I'm sure the time was a bit low. Unreal x-ray tactic with the queen through the two rooks. And, um, you know, if black just plays something like king h7 and queen h8, and it's mate in two. Uh, if black plays something like f6, now the rook comes in. And it's over. So bishop d4 straight up wins the game. Instead of that, he got a little worried about rook g3 and played king h2. The problem with king h2 is that now you lose the rook, number one, and you lose your activity, but you've really, you haven't slowed down black's attack, and there's just too many threats now. Um, and uh, bishop f3, and it all falls apart here with knight takes f2. And the point is that if rook f2, queen g3... If bishop takes f2, there is rook h6 check, and the queen is lost, actually. So, yeah, knight takes f2, and uh, Tabatabe resigned in one of the most complex tactical shootouts in, of a Catalan I've ever seen in my life. That game was completely ludicrous. And that takes me to my final game. Hopefully you didn't skip to it, even though I probably put something funny on the timestamps indicating that you were going to skip to it. And this is a game between Ali Reza Faruja and Krishnan Saskaran from India. Um, board one, round eight, Ali Reza Faruja uh, and uh, Saskaran, I think tied for, uh, half a point separates them for first place. Ali Reza sits atop with a half point lead. Now, we have an Italian game, bishop c4, bishop c5. We have normal gioco pianissimo. Nobody plays c3, d4. As good as it is at the intermediate level, it's completely equal and no chance for an advantage at the high level. Now, Saskaran here does not go for traditional d6, h6, a5 stuff. He plays d5. Now, d5 is an ultra committal move because your position is really bound together by the safety of your center. And you're going to get a lot of active bishop play, knight play around that center, but you're playing against an ultra theoretically knowledgeable and tactically gifted young player. Not talking like one of the older guys. I mean, Farouche is still a teenager. So you got to know what you're doing. Can Saskaran figure it out? Let's, 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 let's see. Rook e1, nothing surprising about this move. Attacking the pawn. Bishop g4 defending. We're still in theory. I am not good at drawing arrows. Knight d2. Knight d2 uh, reinforces the knight and pressures this. Black plays knight b6, targeting the bishop. The bishop moves... Uh, sorry, first we attack this bishop. Bishop moves out of the way. And in this position, according to theory... The most popular move and poorest scoring has been bishop b5. The point is to get rid of this knight and maybe target this and maintain defense of this. But recently, every top player, even though according to the statistics, it's the third most popular move in this position, every top player is playing bishop b3. If you first plug this into an engine, it thinks that move is completely idiotic because it thinks that queen d3 is possible. However, if you play queen, the move queen takes d3, white plays this. Both queens hang in the, in, the, in the crossfire. The best move here for black is queen f5, and theory keeps on going. Um, the point is that you, you both can lose a queen there, but white ends up with a better position. Um, but Saskaran plays king h8. This move has been played three times, uh, actually by Aranyan himself. The point, obviously, you move the bishop out of the you know, king over here, and maybe f5 in the future. But knight d7, uh, now we're in completely new territory. So the bishop has to be moved. It cannot be defended. It has to be moved. Uh, clearly, he did not like the knight rotation, right? And now if the bishop goes to g6, the pawn is just going to be taken. And you think, Levy, what's so special about that? Queen d3? No, 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 not so fast. And if bishop f6 trying to take, I can actually even play rook e1, but I can make a case for playing rook e3 as well and defending my pawn. That aside, we're in brand new territory. Ali Reza plays bishop d5. The idea of bishop d5 is to take this knight at some point in the future. 
remove a guard of this, but more than anything else, it's actually also to advance your queen side. So, f5. We have to justify moving the king out of the way. Knight g5. And Sasikaran is like, yo, bring it on. That's bold, but that's also a fork. And that's a rook. Alireza wanders in with his horsey and takes the rook. He's like, um, with all due respect, I don't understand what the hell is going on here. And now, the best move. D4. Now that move looks like black gets a nice little wedge and everything, except y your bishop's hanging. So, you can't do anything with shoving the pawn forward. Alireza calculates correctly that after something like e takes d4, for example, it's not even about taking back. He's going to play rook e6. And the queen is almost trapped. And um, we have e4 in the game. And Sasi Kiran, for a brief moment, is just straight up down a rook, but he's going to be winning this knight back. So what does Ali Reza do here? It's actually a pretty tense position. For example, if he plays something like bishop to f4, knight f3 is a problem. Because you actually can lose. A full rook down, but you can lose. Queen g6 and you're mated. Like, I mean, I mean, bishop g5, e3, I mean, I'm just going to keep coming, keep, keep coming with my pawns, f4, e3, blah, blah, blah. Like, you, you don't get made it, but you're going to lose all your pieces. So it's a very tense position. So what does Ali Reza do? When in doubt, sack your queen. Simple. Knight d7. Beautiful move. Switch and zook. Bishop hangs, queen hangs, rook hangs. And now, take the knight first. Ali Reza chops down everything. Takes on e5, takes on c6, rook e8, because if you take, um, I just take on f8, right? So he moves the rook out of the way, and when the dust settles, one man in this position has a rook, bishop, knight for a queen. And Ali Reza takes on c7. Now, black is going to create some active counterplay. You have to be a little careful, as we've seen throughout this video. Rook d4 brings the bishop back. And how are you going to, how are you going to tip this position completely winning for white? The queen side brings the rook to consolidate, and a few moves later, uh, he got a rook, a rook's off the board, even at the cost of a pawn, and the only way that white will break through is on the queen side. C4, a few moves later, we get B5, take, 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 uh, well, if, sorry, if, if take, then this, so queen E6, and the king hides, the bishop, the bishop and the rook coordinate very nicely, Ali Reza completely safe over here, nothing going on, and on move 43, he resigned the game, uh, cr uh, not Ali Reza, uh, Krishnan Sasikiran resigned the game, and Firuja won. Smooth sailing against an extremely strong Grandmaster, and with this win, after eight rounds, Firuja sits on top with a one-point lead with three games to go, six and a half out of eight. He is number four in the world rankings, higher rated than the champion um, then the championship challenger, Jan Nipomnici, unbelievable stuff. He is like four rating points, three rating points away from Fabiano Caruana. It is crazy. And if Caruana draws his game against uh, Niels Grandelius today, it's a chance he actually becomes number three. Totally nuts. Thank you so much for making it this far in the recap. Now you know how to beat a 2800. Go ahead and do it. And maybe in a few videos, you'll know how to win the entire tournament, the Grand Swiss. Peace out, y'all. Get out of here.